we have another, well, this is a regional, uh, a Southern regional related question, but this ties into something that we said uh, about on the program about studio announcers. When, when was that last week or whenever that was? Um, Chris says, I grew up watching Saturday afternoon wrestling with my grandfather on WDEF in Chattanooga, Tennessee. That's Channel 12, by the way, folks, hosted by Harry Thornton. It was a big part of my childhood and a great memory of my papa. It was during the mid-70s to the early 80s. I was wondering if you had any Harry Thornton stories or stories about that particular region. Harry Thornton was a classic example of the local wrestling announcer that was a bigger star than anybody on the program and was a, just de-drizzling shits. He was the... Imagine an old gray-haired guy, heavy set with a little mustache in one of those late 60s, early 70s leisure suits that I know you never spent a lot of time in, in East or Central Tennessee, but imagine... Your uncle, who was an insurance salesman in Oak Ridge, would wear one of these checkered leisure suits, uh, double knit, that looked like uh, your grandmother's fucking kitchen tablecloth. And Harry Thornton did the highest rated morning show in the Chattanooga market. And I don't, I think this, uh, gosh, um, there is an excellent Scott T Teal and Tim Dills and my gosh, uh, um, David Williamson may have had something. I can't remember who all did it, but they did a history of Chattanooga wrestling and all the results because uh, Nick and Roy had started running Chattanooga. That was their second town. They started Nashville in 1940. They branched out to Chattanooga sometime in the late 40s, the Nashville booking office. So they had been running the Chattanooga Memorial Auditorium weekly since the 40s. And wrestling was already established, but sometime in the late 50s, early 60s, they made a deal with Harry Thornton. And I don't know what the population of Chattanooga, Tennessee was in like 1960. Maybe some enterprising young man with access to a Google machine while I'm droning on can figure out how many people lived in Chattanooga, Tennessee in 1960. But they made a deal with Harry Thornton. And I don't know the particulars, but they got on Channel 12, which was a, a major network affiliate, and Harry Thornton became not only the host of the stu studio show in Chattanooga, but he was hosting the most popular morning show in the market, and he also, wouldn't you know who won the, the pony, became one of the listed promoters which I think was the the way they used to do if they if there was a guy in a town that could get you TV, draw you people or whatever, you would cut him in for points in the town, a percentage, 5% or 10% or whatever the percent may have been. And so I'm pretty sure that to land this deal and to land Harry Thornton, they cut Harry in for a decent percentage of Chattanooga. And the attendance immediately started going up with the new TV and with the, this personality on it. And they had runs in the 60s and early 70s where hot programs – in the main events, they would sell out the Memorial Auditorium several weeks in a row, and they would regularly do 3,000 people. And I mean, you know, I think they announced in the paper one time they shoehorned 6,400 people into that building, and it was a record crowd. And that had to be with fire department cooperation because it had to be illegal. They had a big set of pull-out bleachers like a like a graduation or something that they would pull on this massive stage. And then you could put seats all around the ring and there were permanent seating in a bowl. Cause it was an auditorium type of thing, but they lit literally packed that place on and off for 20 fucking years through the mid seventies. They would, they would, uh, so it, it figured just if, if you're even talking about an average of three or 4,000 people a week, that was, 150, 200,000 tickets in, in a town of what would the population be? In 1970, right. it would have been about 120,000. In 1980, about 170,000. So there's the range. Okay, you're talking about selling better than the population of the town per year in live event wrestling tickets. That's what that's that's why that that guys like Fargo and a lot of people said that he shouldn't be in the Hall of Fame. What about his drawing power in the Wrestling Observer Hall of Fame? The guys like that put 5000 people in buildings every week in Birmingham and Chattanooga and almost five in Nashville. It wasn't that big and Louisville and back in those days, almost that 
so for so long because they were kept in top spots for so long that they actually drew more money than guys who main evented in places like Madison Square Garden or in fucking the Omni for shorter periods of time. They sold more tickets. So Harry Thornton, he was, I'm sure he was a Republican. And I'm sure he'd still be a Republican today. And he had this, this, the woman co-host on the, the morning show was Miss Betty or whatever. And she gave cooking tips. I don't know, but it was, it was everybody in town knew who Harry Thornton was. And so he was an entree for people to watch the wrestling program. And then they'd get caught up in it, especially Harry calling it. And he was, he demanded, he would never put the heels over because he was going to stay baby face. Right. I mean, even he did publicity pictures where in the days before Photoshop, he'd take like the exacto knife and cut a picture of himself sitting at his desk and superimpose it in between a picture of Nick Goulas and Roy Welch from Nashville, where he'd be bigger than they were. And so <laughs> Chattanooga promoters, Harry Thornton, Nick Goulas and Roy Welch. Right. And he would, he would not, it let the heels get any heat on him whatsoever verbally or he, you know he would shout them down and that's what the people loved about the program was that harry thornton would be bickering with the fucking heels who weren't allowed to hit him so it, if you if you couldn't figure out a way to work with him somehow uh, given the limitations he'd just bury the heels take the heat off of them but what are you going to do <clears throat> i've got one tape from 1980 i think was right before he retired and Nick was going out of business anyway, uh, where Bobby Eaton had switched heel and joined Tojo Yamamoto. And and Harry would call Bobby and he, well, Bobby, it's nice to see you. And he'd shake his hand. I'm sorry to see you in such bad company. He's not going to be mad at Bobby because Bobby's a baby face, right? Or been a baby face. <laughs> but Tojo, he had nothing good to say about Tojo. And he'd call him a little slant-eyed, no good. And Tojo would say, what do you got to say to me, Harry Thorne? You want to say something, spit it out. Or no, Harry Thorne would say, you want, you got something to say, Tojo, spit it out. Oh, Harry Thorne, you want me to spit in your face? If you do, I'll knock your hat off or whatever. I and mean, they'd just argue with each other, right? But it grew somehow for all those years. So uh, Harry Thornton is one of those guys that Ed Whalen stampede wrestling he was a key to getting television so he was a rotten announcer but they had to keep him and he was a as big a star or bigger name identity than anybody on the program in this market that was the same thing and they i mean you know once again a town of less than two hundred thousand people selling up to two hundred thousand wrestling tickets a year and the most watched local program in the chattanooga market was harry thorne's morning show and live studio wrestling it's like, imagine if David Crockett was actually beloved by a local wrestling fan. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> oh, and one time, because we used to get the Chattanooga show when, when there was in Louisville, a lot of times in the mid seventies, there were two local time slots. One would be the Memphis show and one would be one of Nick's shows that they would bring up to show something different. And Harry Thornton's call it, I think it was like, it had to be like 74 Tex McKenzie. Right. And it was only fitting that the world's worst wrestling announcer would be called the world's <laughs> worst wrestler's match. But Tex McKenzie is legitimately like six, seven and two sixty five. Right. He was even a tall cowboy and he got over. He was a big name in wrestling, even though he couldn't work because of that charisma and the promo. And he looked like the big cowboy. Right. But he's got this. The fucking deal he used to do where he's got the head scissors on the, on the, his opponent and he's taking that long leg. He'll have the head scissors on the guy on the mat and it'll take the long leg and stick it straight up in the air and bring it down and do the fucking clop on the guy's fucking neck. Oh God, he'd sell it. And Harry thought, look at that. Look at those long legs. And you can almost hear Nick Goulas whispering to him in the background. Tell him the boy is seven feet tall. Yes, a seven feet tall is Tex McKenzie. That's right. A seven feet tall, 265 pounds. They didn't exaggerate his weight, but they gave him <laughs> like six extra inches. So now he's seven feet tall and 260 pounds. He looked like a, a bean pole. But, you know, it, Harry Thornton. That's at the end of a Tex Robin McKenzie. McKenzie. Harry Thornton. Tex McKenzie. <laughs> but there you have it. Uh, the world's over, worst wrestler, but over everywhere he went. Yes. But see, here's the thing. We talked about the difference in that and the Ultimate Warrior. Tex McKenzie, from all accounts, I did not get to meet him. I saw him live a number of times as a fan, but he was gone by the time I got into business. But he was a likable guy, friendly to the boys, klutzy, and knew it. 
had a weird personal charisma. People liked to see him, and he looked great, and he had the promo, and he was a cowboy. Um, but he knew that guys were helping him or that, you know, that he, he didn't think that he was the, he didn't come off as the star of the show and he didn't refuse to learn. He was just a klutz and it, it got to be part of the, the guy's endearing charm at that point. He's the one that fucking Dundee told me the story. He was a huge baby face for Barnett in Australia in the sixties. And they've got Gary Hart in the cage. When Tex McKenzie's going to face, you know, Mark Lewin or whoever Gary's charge was. And the first thing that fucking Tex McKenzie does when he gets in the goddamn ring is they're, they're hauling Gary Hart up in the cage and he grabs the bottom of it and swings it way out and the people roar. And McKenzie turns around and puts the big hands up like, yeah, I did it. And the cage comes back and fucking hits him in the back of the head and knocks him fucking out cold. Right there. Boom. Done. No match. But, you know, the guys didn't mind if you could draw money with a guy if he knew that you were helping him and he wasn't being a prick about it. But that was not the case with, you know, the female or the male sable, the ultimate warrior. But anyway, 